Thank you, everyone, for coming. It means a lot to me that you're all here. Um, yeah, so this is a talk about five years of, of my life, um, although I'm not going to talk about a huge fraction of, of my work, which was hardware, hardware related stuff. But if you're curious about that, um, I'll be happy to talk to you about it for many, many hours. Um, Joel knows. <laughs> So uh, this, this, this paper here um, is in the process of being published, uh, journal review now, and it's available on, on the archive. Um, so it's a combination of two, two theses, um, mine, which I'll be talking about here, and then uh, Tony, Tony Tong um, at Harvard, who's a grad student that, that just attended a couple months ago. Um, okay, so I think a common uh, point of confusion is just, what do you mean by, by fundamental physics? Because Physics is supposed to be sort of the fundamental search. It's applied math. Um, and so it, it wasn't always clear, actually, what this meant. And it's still, it's still not perfectly well defined, but I'll try to give you a, a rough idea. Um, so in the early 1900s, things were very unclear. Um, there were really two separate fundamental fields of study. Um, there was physics. Uh, you had Newton's great achievement of, of understanding mechanics. And then you had Maxwell's electromagnetism. And then the great achievements of statistical physics and, and thermodynamics. Um, but there were these, these weird things called atoms and molecules that did all, or all kinds of fancy things. Um, and none of the physical principles were derivable from chemistry. And conversely, all of the interesting features of, of atoms and molecules um, were sort of considered fundamental or separate. And in fact, a lot of people had given up hope that at, at, at this turn of the century, people kind of thought physics was nearly done um, and that chemistry would always be a separate thing that you would just never be able to understand uh, the behavior of fundamental particles from the perspective of, of physical principles. Um, and today we know that that was very wrong, fortunately, um, and, and it, it is possible to derive, at least in principle, maybe there's some interesting questions there if you want to talk about that, um, where you can derive any, any phenomenon that, that you can observe um, from physical principles, uh, at least in some limit behavior. Um, and it really comes from these two pieces of, of modern physics that were discover, discovered around the same time um, and separately, Albert Einstein having a pivotal, pivotal role in both of them, um, quantum mechanics and special relativity. And the union of those two things being combined into a single consistent mathematical framework actually restricts you to having exactly two types of fundamental particles. You know, fermions or bosons, um, and their properties, their basic properties are derivable from uh, objects called quantum fields um, and how those interact with each other. And so all of the rest of physics and chemistry and everything you see around you is an emergent property of these, of these uh, quantum fields. Um, so here are all of the known particles, which are uh, quantized um, excitations of the quantum fields. Um, there's uh, these three guys make up basically everything that you interact with on a daily basis, your protons and neutrons, and then the electrons to give you neutral atoms. Um, and then photons are the interactions between things with electric charge. All of these columns have electric charge, and these ones are neutral. They're neutrinos. Um, and then you have the force-carrying particles, W and Z bosons responsible for the weak nuclear force, which powers the sun. Um, and then you have photon, as I said. The gluon is the strong nuclear force. It binds quarks together and makes bound states, um, forms things like nuclei. Um, and of course, the newest piece that was the, the great achievement of both the 70s of theoretical physics and uh, the 2012 of experimental physics was the discovery of, of this Higgs boson, which is fundamentally different from every other particle on this table um, and plays an essential role in making all of physics work the way it should, the way that, you, that you're used to it. Without the Higgs, none of those things would have mass, except for possibly bound states of, of strongly coupled particles. But that's actually an open question. Um, it's one of the Millennium Prize problems to see if that's true or not. Um, but importantly, the way that these things couple to each other um, is determined by some dimensionless constants called couplings. And the way that the, the size of those couplings actually depends on the scale at which you measure them. Um, and this, this, this plot is probably, at least in my opinion, one of the deepest ways, the ways that fundamental physics has really changed in the modern era. Um, these, so this uh, blue line here, this green line, and the red line are the gauge forces. They're the strong, weak um, forces, and then electromagnetism. 
the, the couplings change as a function of energy and then they almost meet here. And this almost meeting has been the motivation for a large amount of research in theoretical physics. Um, and this is a so-called gauge unification. But there's actually a bunch more dimensionless parameters in the standard model. Um, and importantly, they're the ones that determine how strongly the Higgs interacts with the other particles um, and determines their, their fundamental masses. And so those are called Yukawa couplings and they're shown here. Top quark, Yuka oh sorry. The top quark Yukawa coupling being the largest, which you can't, uh, it's the purple. purple, yes, is here um, running down. And then the Higgs also couples with itself and in fact, the coupling of the Higgs with itself becomes negative within the standard model um, at a very high energy scale. And this is actually a, a pretty important thing because this is marginal. We don't know exactly to within measurement precision where this lies. It looks like it just barely becomes negative. Um, and this is the fact that the, the vacuum in the standard model is actually metastable and can decay potentially. So this is an interesting problem that we don't, don't fully understand yet. Um, so anyway, within this modern perspective of all of, of physics and phenomena around you being derivable from fundamental fields, um, the question of fundamental physics is really just about finding all of these quantum fields, which are sort of the, the basic degrees of freedom of nature. So can we, can we list them? And then from them, uh, can we list their interactions? And then once you do that, you need to be able to actually calculate their behavior, which is highly non-trivial, um, and, and a lot of work goes into that. And if you can make calculations, you can go out and test them. Um, so wh where should we be looking for, for new physics, given this picture? Um, and the first obvious place is in disagreements with experiment. That's why we're here. Um, but we're in this sort of world by construction where almost nothing disagrees with experiment. We are really good at describing the universe around us. And so all of the things that really do disagree with experiment are very weird, very elusive properties of the universe that are very difficult to measure. Um, so there's dark matter, which you've all heard about, this mysterious uh, thing that makes Einstein's gravity not appear to work correctly at large distance scales. Um, baryogenesis is just the fact that we observe matter in the universe. You've heard of antimatter, matter and antimatter annihilate, and if you start the universe in thermal equilibrium as the universe cools, you expect all of that matter and antimatter to annihilate each other, and you end up with a universe that has almost only photons um, and, and other things that, that aren't like the particles around you. Um, so explaining how that happened is an open question. And then finally, these elusive new particles, uh, neutrinos, are observed to have mass, but there's no mechanism for that in the standard model, although there are simple extensions. And then there are a couple other kind of uh, marginal things that, that aren't definitely problematic yet, but they, they are worth inspecting because there are marginal discrepancies between theory and experiment. Um, the next question is just theoretical cons consistency is the model that we have consistent with itself? Can you do a calculation that gives you two different answers from different perspectives? Um, and there is this problem that we don't, we don't know how to include gravity in, in quantum mechanics. And in fact, the term quantum gravity may, may, may be fundamentally uh, oxymoronic. Um, then of course, the challenging calculations I alluded to, you can have these particles interact with each other very strongly, and so the perturbative methods that we rely on don't work well. Um, you can have emergent properties of very many particles, which are extremely challenging to simulate, and in fact, in most cases, just intractable. Um, and so there's a lot of work in just understanding many body systems. And then, of course, there's just high order perturbative corrections. At the LHC that I'll talk about, we're, we're probing very complicated, very precise, uh, high order corrections to the physics that we know. Um, and those are, those are cutting edge calculations. And then lastly, and I think it's the reason that, that most of us end up in fundamental physics, is this interesting question of why these particles, why these fields, um, why their structure, why does they, so these fields have to respect the symmetries of space-time, um, and we don't know why space-time has the observed geometry. Uh, so a lot of the motivation for fundamental physics is answering these, which physics doesn't have to give you an answer to this. It could just be true. Um, and I think most of us hope that that's not the case, and, and we hope to have a deeper reason. Okay, so how do you test all this stuff uh, from a collider perspective? Well, you just take the two constants that come out of the special relativity and quantum mechanics that I mentioned earlier. There's the speed of light. This sounds like a fundamental um, speed of light, but that's not really what it is. It's much deeper than that. It's really the fact that because of the geometry of space-time, there is a ratio between the units of meters and seconds, and it is fixed by the geometry of space-time. 
And so you can define actually meters, the ratio of meters to seconds, and it is defined as that number. Um, and you can then pick new units of meters or seconds, such that the, that number is one. Then you also have a number that comes out of quantum mechanics, which is not yet defined because the kilogram is not defined, but it will be, um, which is approximately 10 to the minus 34 joules, which is a unit of energy, the sort of human scale, um, times seconds. And you can also pick units to make that one. And once you do that, um, everything in dimensional analysis that's relevant to us is in units of energy to some power. Um, so units of space and time are, are inversely proportional to, to energy. Mass and momentum are in units of energy. And so our standard unit is the giga electron volt, GeV. I'll be using that term a lot. And then TeV is a thousand times that, which I'll say a lot. Um, and it's just the energy an electron gets if it falls down a billion volts. So you have a billion volt battery, a big battery. Um, but it's also approximately the rest mass of the proton. OK, so in this perspective, distance and energy are inversely proportional. And if you want to probe distances much less than uh, the nuclear scales, you need to just hit them really hard with very high energy particles. And so the, the, the distances that we're currently probing are, are on the order of billionths of a billionth of a meter. And the way we do that is with the world's biggest microscope. Um, it is a, a ring of superconducting magnets, 27 kilometers around. This is the Geneva airport here. Um, I used to live in a pierish. Um, and there's four major experiments around here. Atlas and CMS um, are the two general purpose experiments. And then I worked on, on Atlas. And of course, you can't actually see the ring from above. It's 100 meters underground, so graphics to API. Uh, yeah, so this thing is an enormous achievement. Um, there are 1,200 magnets that are each 30 tons. They're 15 meters long. They have enormous uh, 8.3 Tesla magnetic fields. Um, just the energy stored in the magnetic field is on the order of 10 gigajoules, um, which <laughs> for the physicists in the room is a fun, that is approximately five times the Planck energy, which is interesting. Uh, it's just a lot of energy. Um, and we collide protons with, uh, with this accelerator um, at more than 13,000 times their rest mass. So 13 trillion electron volts, tera electron volts. To do this um, at a reasonable rate, to probe these really short distance scales, you need to just put a lot of protons in there because most of the time they fly right past each other. So we put 2,500 bunches, each with um, 10 to the 11 uh, protons per beam. And the total kinetic energy of the beam is approximately the same as a 1,600 ton train moving at highway speeds. This is <laughs> like a macroscopic train compared to uh, a, a microscopic clump of protons. Um, OK, so, so what do we do with this, with this glider? We take images of what comes out when we collide protons. And we use what is effectively a four-dimensional camera. Um, so we track particles as they go through if they're charged in a 3D way, and then also measure the energy that they deposit in, in calorimeters. And then particles that we can't see fly right through, and we can infer their presence from conservation of momentum. Um, some particles are neutral, so they don't interact with the tracking. And instead, we just see them when they hit the material in the detector, and they emit lots of other charged particles that then um, shower through the detector, and you can see those. And from the shape and uh, width of the shower, um, you can estimate the energy that was deposited by the initial particle. Um, OK, so this thing is enormous. It's 82 feet tall and 144 feet long. It's approximately the size of the Eckhart Research Center right there, um, which has been pointed out uh, in the last three thesis defenses in this room. <laughs> um, it is 7,700 tons. That's uh, American tons, not uh, metric tons. 90 million channels. Um, of, of data output, and it takes pictures, these four-dimensional images, 40 million times a second. Um, so to put that in perspective, the speed of light is about a foot per nanosecond, which means that by the time you're taking the next picture, you're still rolling the shutter across the detector. Right? It, it, you have to roll it across as the particles propagate outwards. So it's really pushing the limits of, of what's possible. Um, oh, and this is a very important number. There's 60 terabytes of data per second coming out of this thing. Um, and so dealing with that huge amount of data is, is a large part of what we do. So it's a big thing. I got to go uh, see it during a shutdown. And Joel, who's in the audience there, came to visit me. Um, so he got to see that. And I think actually my favorite part about this picture is the guy behind us whose mind is absolutely exploding. <laughs> <laughs> He's never seen anything like this in his life. 
Um, so, so the achievement of this, of this wonderful machine was the discovery of the Higgs at approximately 130 times the proton mass. Um, and it's in this really interesting regime. So these particles are unstable, they decay to stuff, and in fact the Higgs, because it's sort of coupled to everything with mass, decays to everything, um, including things that are massless through quantum corrections uh, to their decay process. And so the results, this table shows the, the probability of, of the Higgs to decay to a given uh, particle species. Um, and you can see the most dominant decay is the BB bar, which will come up later. Um, but it's in this interesting spot where if it had been discovered at a lower mass, um, it would have been harder to see bosonic decays to things like WW and ZZ. Um, and then if it had been a little heavier, it would have been much harder to see the fermionic decays, which are these new couplings, these Yukawa couplings that are um, fundamentally different from the gauge interactions that we're more familiar with. Uh, so the Higgs is, is wonderfully phenomenologically interesting. There's a lot of things to observe because of this uh, mass sweet spot. Um, and so we have gone out and observed them. We've seen four primary production modes that are shown in these um, Feynman diagrams here. And then also in five different decay modes. And it's very Higgs-like. It looks exactly like the standard model Higgs to within our experimental precision, which is very interesting. Um, but there's sort of one, one piece, one major piece of the Higgs mechanism that has yet to be observed. And that's the fact that it can interact with itself. Um, and so there's a diagram. Um, these pictures for non-physicists are, you can just think of them as sort of literally particles touching each other. Um, that's not, they actually represent integrals over um, a, a complicated mathematical space. But it um, just represents, at the end of the day, a number that says, how likely is this process to happen? Um, and we can measure how the rate of this and infer this coupling of the Higgs to itself. And so that's the, the effort behind my thesis. Um, to measure this interaction. And then there can also be large enhancements to this process if there's some new particle in here that can decay to two Higgs. So we look for both of those things. Um, and a big piece is uh, the way that the, the Higgs mechanism works is that it allows the physical states within the standard model to violate the symmetries underlying that same standard model. So you see this parabola here is symmetric about the origin. And so the vacuum state um, of this Higgs field uh, here, shown as this little ball, is right in the middle. And from this perspective, the particle is symmetric to, to the, the field space. Um, but actually, as the universe cooled, this affected potential changed shape. And eventually, the ground state became um, dislocated from, from the origin here. And the result is that you spontaneously break this symmetry as the ground state rolls down to a new position. And this is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's what allows particles to have mass in the first place. So we know that this happened, but what we don't know is the precise nature of, of this phase change um, in the early universe. So this transition between massless symmetric phase and the broken symmetry phase where particles acquired mass happened about 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 11 seconds after the Big Bang. And the precise nature of that phase change um, could tell us a lot about how we ended up in a universe with lots of matter in it. Um, and so there's these three conditions you need to generate particles. First, you need to generate them in the first place in equal parts, bar uh, baryons or antibaryons. And then you need to treat the baryons differently from the antibaryons so that you don't just annihilate everything and end up with photons. And then finally, the less obvious piece is that all of this has to happen out of equilibrium um, because if it's in thermal equilibrium the whole time, all these processes um, will cancel out. You'll still end up with the observed number uh, of baryons um, is 10 to the minus 10. Uh, parts per, per photon instead of the ex expected value uh, from the standard model calculation of 10 to the minus 18. So that's a big discrepancy. Okay, so how do we look for di Higgs production? The first uh, piece is you, you have to consider the fact that this process is exceedingly rare. And so um, you have to think, I now have two Higgs bosons which can each decay in one of a myriad of ways. Um, and the total rate is now suppressed by that branching fraction. Um, so the most common channel is the 4B channel, which I'll talk about. Um, given the standard model expectation with the data set that I'm talking about in my thesis, we expect a total of 300 of these events to, to have been produced. This is in contrast to 40 million collisions uh, or bunch crossings per second, each with 60 collisions. Um, so there's an enormous background here, and it's very difficult even just to beat back the background in the online selection where we, where we select these events before we analyze them. Um, and then there are other channels that, that have more challenging, um, well, they have similar challenging backgrounds, but lower rates. 
And then there are cleaner channels, the BB tau tau. Taus are like electrons, but they're heavier. Um, and then BB gamma gamma, gamma means photon. So these are just two B quarks and two photons. This is a very clean channel. It doesn't look like other um, regular processes at the LHC, but we would only expect one event to have been produced this whole time. So you would have to be able to see that one event, select it, and statistically say with significance that it wasn't just a fluke. And that's essentially impossible. So um, in my analysis, I look at the 4B channel and say, okay, we just have to deal with this huge background. It's the only way to get enough statistics to say anything at this early juncture. Um, so this is a really messy final state. When, when quarks are produced, they hadronize, so they, they decay in a, in, in a messy jet of stuff. And what we see is just a, a bunch of tracks through our detector. Um, and so what we do is we, we, we first look for tracks that are consistent with the common origin. Um, so that you can beat back uh, various backgrounds. Then you associate all of those tracks to deposits in the calorimeter, so these are the energy deposits, which let you measure um, the, 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 the complete four vector of your initial uh, uh, B quark. And then you use the fact that these, these B quarks, um, which are unstable, uh, must decay, but they must do so through the weak nuclear force, which means it actually takes a finite amount of time for them to decay. And because they're produced at relativistic speeds, um, they actually propagate a mil on the order of a millimeter before they decay. So you can look for these displaced vertices um, uh, to, to reject most of the uh, multi-jet background that looks just like this, but without displaced vertices. And then because we're looking for two Higgs, each decaying to two, two Bs, um, we look for events with four uh, jets like this. And then we can use a multivariate algorithm that takes all of these complicated inputs um, it's, it's a machine learning algorithm that's trained on signal versus background um, and then calibrated in data. And it just outputs a number between minus one and one. And we place some cut on that uh, specifically to accept about 70% of, of all the jets that are produced. Um, and so this is what it actually looks like, right? So this is the cartoon. Um, this is a real event display from, from data. There are four jets here that were all B tagged. And then you see these little deposits um, in the calorimeter systems. Um, and this, this event happens to have a, ma a mass just above the threshold to produce two Higgs bosons. Um, okay, so th there's a complicated piece, which is that in, in BB tau tau or BB gamma gamma, the two Higgs, Higgses are decaying by different channels, and so you can just use the fact that the particles look different to pair those objects into Higgs candidates. Um, and the best way to reduce your, your background is to select events where the invariant mass of the objects is consistent with the Higgs boson that produced them. Um, but when you have four B jets that are the same, uh, there's three ways to pair them. And so the first attempts to do this analysis just gave up on this combinatoric issue and looked in this high mass phase space where the Higgses are produced with a large momentum. And the result is that their decay products are collimated. Um, so then you just select the two B jets that are close together and you, and you make a Higgs candidate. Um, and in that phase space, the background is also much, much uh, lower. So if you produce the Higgs bosons at rest, the B-jets will decay back to back in the lab frame. And so you actually would want to pair them the other way. And then if they're sort of in this intermediate regime, uh, it's really not obvious how you should pair these jets. Um, and so, what, so the, the algorithm that, that I developed um, looks at the invariant mass of the two die-jet systems, and then considers the possible pairings, so the three possible pairings, and then you just say, okay, which one is closest to a line going through the origin and where we would expect the Higgs, die Higgs signal to show up. And this way, you, you use some of the mass information to select the correct pairing, but you don't use so much that you always select the background event that falls in your signal region, because that will dilute your signal to background ratio. Um, and this, this pairing works quite well. Um, we get about 95% of the, of the pairings correct, um, and it, far less background gets sculpted into the, into the signal region. And then the last piece is that you don't want to deal with the combinatoric background in the high mass regime where it's obvious. So if the Higgs is boosted, the, the total mass of the system is very high, you expect the VJs to be close together and you don't want to deal with this issue. So we apply a sliding window as a function of, of the four body mass um, on the delta, the delta R, so the angular distance between, between VJs um, before, before choosing the one that's closest to that line. Okay, so <laughs> we started with 315 events, but we still need to apply a selection to reduce background and to be able to select these events in data um, as, oppo uh, as opposed to most events which we have to throw away because the total data coming out of the detector is 
uh, too much volume to deal with to record. Um, so the first piece, we, we put a transverse momentum threshold um, and an angular threshold just from the acceptance of, of the detector and the trigger. Um, and the result is that you're already down to about 5% of your events. So we went from 315 to 15. Um, and you have a similar problem in all of the other channels so that PB gamma gamma one event becomes much less than one event. Um, okay, so the, the, the angular acceptance and, and threshold, PT threshold is responsible for about 20% of this loss. And then the B tagging is 70%, um, right? So the fourth power is so about 24%. And the result is 5%. Um, then we apply those delta R windows that I mentioned. Um, this is intentionally loose. We don't want to remove signal. All we want to do is remove that combinatoric background. Um, so just not remove events, but just remove possible pairings. Then we apply cuts on the Higgs candidate PT as a function of the four body mass. The idea here is that at very high masses, um, you have low background and so you don't want to have to cut as tightly. Whereas at low masses, you can beat back the background by having a more stringent uh, transverse momentum cut. So we apply a sliding, a sliding cut on that. Um, the multi-jet background produced by proton collisions is mostly in the forward direction. They're colliding with each other and they mostly just shoot through each other and shower in the forward direction. Whereas when you produce a heavy particle, it can decay isotropically. So we, we cut out particles that are decayed um, more forward in the detector. And then finally, well not finally, but the main, the most important cut where we lose most of our signal events is just selecting events where the invariant mass of, the, of both digest systems is consistent with the Higgs mass. Um, and so this brings us down to six uh, events, but this is what reduces 90% of our background. So it really is, this is an optimal, um, very close to optimal cut. You could also make this cut a function of the four body mass, make it looser at high mass, for example, and gain a little bit of sensitivity, which is something to think about in the next round. Um, and then finally, there are other, these, these top quarks, um, which Mel worked on, on the discovery of, is the heaviest particle in the standard model. Um, and they are a, now a significant background instead of a Nobel Prize winning you know, achievement. They are <laughs> something that we are annoyed about. Um, and we, we reduce them at a high rate, and so it's fairly easy actually to select these and remove a, a large fraction of them without, without damaging signal acceptance. And then finally, we have to be able to select, given all of these cuts, we have to be able to say online in the trigger before we store these events if we want to keep them or not. And that's, and that's what we call a trigger. And so the trigger is broken up into two stages. One's a hardware-based trigger that operates at a very high rate, so it takes in the full 40 megahertz off the detector, and then passes events out of it at approximately 100 kilohertz. Um, and this is really the limiting factor for this analysis. And then we can do a next stage of triggering that uses a supercomputing farm um, and operates in software and does more precision measurements. And so this takes in the 100 kilohertz events rate from the level one trigger, and then selects events at about 1,000 per second, uh, which are then stored to tape. Um, and so this is the efficiency curve for various hypothesized um, resonance masses, and then also for the full standard model dihigs production. And we can, we're, we're doing pretty well across the full range. Okay, so probably the bulk of the work of uh, this analysis is really just understanding this very large background of multi-jet production. It's very difficult because the calculations that you would need to do in the theory community to estimate how often this should happen and with what angular correlations are essentially intractable. And so there are no good theoretical uh, simulations of this process. Instead, uh, we select events in data that look very similar, um, but we don't expect signal to show up, and that's by inverting the VTAC requirement on two jets. So now we have two V-jets and two jets produced by other random garbage. Um, and we can use that to estimate the 4B process. Um, and so the way we do that is we slice up this Higgs uh, 2D mass plane into regions. Um, we can use this outer sideband where we don't expect any signal to reweight the 2B data to match the 4B data in that region, and then apply the same weights that we derived in the control region to estimate uh, how well we're doing with our model. And then we can reapply that same procedure in this region and compare the different models in the signal region, which I'll show in a second. This is the signal region, and this is a shown simulated signal process, which is much easier to simulate. Um, and so this is what the Dye Higgs uh, production would look like in the standard model, and you would see most of the signal events peaking here in this, in this region. And so that's the region that we select. Um, and then finally, uh, 
because we expect signal to be in this region with a given mass, we can correct for mis mismeasurements of the Higgs boson properties by rescaling our four vectors to match the expected mass. And so doing that sharpens up um, our, our resolution in this final uh, four body mass spectrum, which we call MHH. Okay, and then we can check all of this background modeling procedure into analogous regions to the signal region, which are below and above the signal region, respectively. So we call those the validation regions. Okay, um, another really uh, non-trivial piece uh, of this background procedure is that when you select exactly two B-jets instead of greater than or equal to four, you're biasing your background estimate to have fewer jets in your event. Um, so if you have exactly uh, two B-jets and two non-B-jets, you can just weight this event by some factor for each of the non-B-jets, we call pseudo tag rate F, and so then we weight this event by F squared, and then if you have additional jets, you have to pick which ones are you going to treat as B jets um, in order to drive your background model. And there's four possible ways to pick um, at least two of these. So you can do one and two, you can do one and three, you can do two and three, and then you can do all three of them. And so each of these picks up a different factor. But what we really care about is how likely is it for this type of event to fall into the, the four tag selection in our, in our two tag estimate. And so we can just add up these weights you get 3f squared minus 2f, and the result is that this type of event should be weighted with a factor almost three times as large as the previous type of event where you only have four jets. Um, and so this is the sort of general case table of what that looks like. Um, we don't need to dwell on that. Um, and this is the, the end of the day result. Um, and so I'll be showing a lot of plots like this. These are histograms. The idea is the black points are real events observed in data, and the uh, solid colored bars are our background estimate. And so the background estimate here looks nothing like the data. This is the number of jets observed in the event. And then when we apply this combinatoric correction uh, on the jet multiplicity, it, it largely flattens out that ratio. So this is a huge improvement. And it's important to model this extra activity because it affects the angular correlations of all the activity in the event. And when you have lots of extra jets in the event, you can also boost the entire system um, in one direction or the other as it recoils against the extra jet activity in the event. Um, okay, and then there's this, this final very major piece, which is that you don't expect the scattering process to be the same in the two tag data versus the four tag data. Uh, they have all of the same underlying quantum processes, but they contribute in different directions. And so the result is you expect different correlations between variables and different kinematic dependence. Um, and so we can correct for that by taking some subset of distributions and applying an iterative uh, reweight procedure to each of these distributions. And the result is that now the background model by construction matches uh, the data on these distributions. So this is done in the sideband. And then we can check that these corrections still work in the control region as we move towards the signal region. And so you can see here that this looks much better than the pre-reweighted distributions. So we're still applying at least roughly the correct correction but perhaps it's not perfect. So we just rederive um, the background model in the control region uh, to match up these distributions. And then we can compare um, how the final discriminant MHH looks uh, between these two models and allow the final fit to our signal region data to uh, pull these distributions in one way or the other to match the observed data. And so this is how we account for the, the systematic bias in deriving the background model in a kinematic phase space that's orthogonal to the signal region. Um, okay, and a, a really cool uh, plot that just shows how well this works is that this is the region we use to derive the background model here. Um, so this is a plot of that mass plane with the data, the ratio of the data over the background. And you can see there's a big peak here and sort of deficits over here, and it looks terrible. And then after applying the corrections derived in this region, the entire mass plane looks flattened out. So it really, there, there is something underlying this procedure that we are truly measuring the differences in scattering between two jet, two B-jet and four B-jet processes. Um, okay, and then there's this TT bar background that I mentioned, which is about 5% of the total background at the end of the day, but it's still important to measure. Um, we can just take uh, semi-leptonic top decays, they can decay with a muon, which is very clear to see from, from the background. We get a very pure TT bar sample, so we normalize the semi leptonic TT bar background that way. And then for the hadronic top decays, where it decays into three jets, um, what we can just do is take one of the jets from the Higgs candidate and then take any two other jets in the event. We pair these and see if it's consistent with the W boson mass. 
and then check that the whole three jet system is consistent with the top mass. Um, and we define a variable XWT, which is analogous to the XHH variable that we used to define the Higgs candidate signal region. And we cut on, on well, we use this to find events with, with top candidates. Um, and so I should say an important piece of this is that you want to make sure that this discriminant is defined in exactly the same way. There's no bias between this discriminant defined on the four tag data and on the two tag data, which is why we don't apply a B tagging requirement on these, despite the fact that these are expected to not be B jets. Um, and so there, there, there's maybe some ways to get around this that, that are worth investigating for the future. But at the end of the day, this is what that XWT distribution looks like um, in, the, in the sideband region. And I, I should say, again, this, is, this flat ratio is really an achievement. If you don't do the kinematic reweights and you don't do the NJET combinatorics, this looks terrible. Um, and it's because this, comp, this we're picking the three jets that minimize this variable, which means it depends intricately on how many jets there are in the event and their angular correlations. Um, okay, so then we can use this distribution to normalize these, the, the, this lighter blue background um, in combination with the muon uh, region to normalize the dark blue background. Um, and so we do that, and then we cut out most of that background in the final signal region. And so this removes about 50% of the total TQR. Um, okay, so now it's time. This is the entire background model. We can check how this model performs in these two um, pseudo signal regions. One sort of roughly centered around the Z boson mass, and then one centered around some high mass hypothetical object where we don't expect to see any signal. Um, and this is what these, these distributions look like uh, in, the, in those two regions. So this is the low mass phase space and the high mass phase space. Um, this shape is super bizarre, and there's an entire appendix in my thesis that describes why this shape comes about. And it actually depends intricately on the four body mass and how it correlates with the number of jets in the event. Um, and so the fact that this is well modeled is actually also surprising and, and really cool. Um, and then this is the, the simpler high mass phase space that is also uh, modeled very well. So with that, we move on to the signal region and see if there's any new physics. And there's probably not. Um, <laughs> the, I should say the 2015 and 2016 data sets were treated separately because the triggers used online were different. Um, and there was actually a huge amount of work that went into that fact. Um, and so the triggers used in this, in this data set are really quite incredible. And they're, they're better than the ones that are used in our sister experiment. Um, in France, uh, CMS. So the fact that this analysis is possible in the first place relies heavily on these online triggers. Um, so I'm moving to CMS after this, and we'll be doing a lot of work on that. Um, so so this, is the, this is the final discriminant. Uh, most of the data is here in the 2016 data set. And there is one bin, maybe two bins, that are high. And so you can quantify and say, how likely is it to observe an excess of this magnitude given this entire distribution? Um, and basically, you do that by just taking your background distribution, you throw pseudo experiments, which means you just randomly sample your background distribution and then look for a big excess. And so the probability of seeing an excess of this size given our background model, assuming it correctly models the background, um, is about 2.3 sigma, um, so a couple percent. It's, it's not crazy to uh, see an excess of this size, especially given that our experiment puts out hundreds of searches. Um, so that's, that's what we saw. Uh, given that there is no globally significant excess, we then move on to set limits on signal strengths for new physics um, or the standard model physics. So these are limits on the possible cross-section of a tensor boson, or sorry, tensor. So this is a spin two object. It could be a massive graviton. Those decay more centrally, and we can set stronger limits on them. And then this would be a new scalar boson like the Higgs, but heavier. Um, and we set limits on, on that as well. And so I think the piece, both of these are interesting and I think they're especially important just as benchmarks to optimize the analysis across this large phase space. This is a full order, order of, well, yeah, full order of magnitude um, in the phase space that we're searching. Um, the Tony Tong's thesis is focused on this piece. Um, and we were able, uh, by working together, to make our selection orthogonal so that we could do a statistical combination. And the result is that, um, his, his selection is, is the reason that we're able to exclude this model all the way up to about uh, 1,300 TV, uh, GeV. Um, oh, and so this is the ratio of our observed limit on the standard model cross-section over the expected cross-section. 
So we are able to exclude an enhancement of a factor of 13, which might not sound uh, that impressive, but in run one, uh, this was basically an order of magnitude larger and, and um, beats the equivalent CMS result by a factor of five. Um, so this, this is a brand new result that was just released on September 4th for the Die Higgs workshop that I went to two weeks ago. Um, and it is a combination of the three channels I mentioned, the four Bs, the BB Tau Tau, and the BB Gamma Gamma. Um, BB Tau Tau came out of nowhere and it has an incredible result that beat <laughs> my observed sensitivity by 0.3. Um, <laughs> But the combination of these three is, is really powerful and, and surprising. So that no one really expected anyone at the LHC to be able to set a limit on this quantity less than 10 by this point, and, and with at least our observed limit is substantially below that, which is maybe a statistical fluctuation or possibly overestimated uh, backgrounds. Um, the other thing I want to point out, this is this modification of the Higgs qubit coupling for setting limits on that um, in the absence of any other changes. And one thing that's interesting is that um, the red result, which is, which is the 4B selection from my thesis, um, is the only one that changes the expected limit relative to the observed limit um, as you scan across this lambda. And that's because we are, one of the, we are the analysis that's most sensitive to changes of this quantity. Um, the other ones are very sensitive to just seeing that Higgs production, but they're less sensitive to um, modifications of this coupling, which is important. Okay, so I have a ton of people to thank for all of this. This is a picture from the Die Higgs workshop that was two weeks ago at Fermilab. Um, a lot of people who worked on this analysis were there with me, and some of them, some of them, Mel and uh, Tony Tong were not there. Um, but I have uh, John Allison especially to thank. Um, he's the postdoc that has carried, carried me through um, learning how the LHC works and also will be my boss uh, starting in October. And then, um, Michael Kagan at Slack has been a wonderful mentor. Jana did a, a huge amount of work editing and preparing this paper and also a lot of studies in, in sensitivity and, and limit setting. And David Wardrobe has just um, also been around on this analysis for a long time and, and has contributed a ton of software work, analysis work, and, and studies and leadership. Um, so yeah, a, a really wonderful group of people that I've, that I've worked with. Um, so thank you. There's a huge list of people I, I will be thanking extensively in my acknowledgments. Um, so I, I shouldn't delve into that, into that now. Um, and of course, friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> It's done in parallel. Okay. So all of this is derived together, um, which is part of the importance of the iterative procedure, yeah. is to make sure that those converge to the same uh, stable quantity. Okay. Um, but a really cool piece, uh, that's all the hardware stuff I did. So um, an obvious piece is, okay, you should include a systematic uncertainty on how you model the TT bar background. Um, but actually, the procedure of doing the multi-jet reweighting is implicitly an estimate of all backgrounds that aren't TT bar, including this modeling of TT bar. And so if you go through and just apply huge variations, so this is a different Monte Carlo generator for the TT bar. Um, this is uh, an artificial reweighting of the XWT spectrum that I did to the TT bar. And then this is a reweighting I applied to the four body mass. Um, and what you see is that after you then derive a background model with these changes applied, the total background model is unchanged. So the, the multi jet 
adapts to correct for the mismodeling of the TP bar. That's assuming that you model the multi check correctly. And so really all of the background systematics are wrapped into this piece of how well you model the multi jet background, which is just everything. Um, and if you miss something that's important, if you have like local correlations and variables, um, you don't expect this procedure to work well. And so a really exciting thing for the next version of this analysis that will now be possible in both 4Bs and dbtau tau is to measure the ZZ, standard model ZZ production, um, as a sort of standard candle. And so this is the same thing that was done for the observation of phase to DB bar in the ZH production um, and WH. Uh, they validated the analysis with B decays of the Z boson. Um, and so we should be able to do the exact same thing and that'll be a really cool measurement. I had uh, one other one that I just wanted to get you to say a little more about, yeah. um, which is uh, the combinatorics where you're looking for the pairs that you know best give you the, the two Higgs masses. And you made some comment about having to be careful to not bias all your background into that, you know, and actually bring them into your signal region and then, and then you sort of, yeah, I, I guess there's more to there to say. Or can you just explain a little more yeah. how that works, please? I wish I just had the plot of what it looks like. Um, well, okay, so every single background event has three possibilities because we require four B-jets. So there are three ways to pair if you just say, like, take the ones um, that make the highest transverse momentum B-jet, or uh, Higgs candidate, that works well in the high mass phase space, but you, by construction, always get the pairing wrong for low mass uh, events. So if the Higgses are produced at rest and they're back to back, you're going to always pair the jets incorrectly. You should have paired these two, you're gonna pair these two. And the result is that your reconstructed mass will be somewhere else, and then when you apply this selection here, you'll lose that event. So you want to get the pairing right. But if you explicitly use the fact that you're looking for events right here to make your pairing, you then take all of your background and you select the ones that are most likely to be in your signal region. Okay. So that's what it comes down to. You can, instead of doing a 2D minimization, we do a one-dimensional minimization so that we still have the rejection power of this direction in the mass plane. Um, but then you can also do slightly better by using a weak hypothesis on the Higgs mass itself by applying, applying those sliding windows on the delta R. So that you just don't even take the hit from the common torque background for high mass events, and you only have to deal with it in this intermediate regime where it's ambiguous. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Guy, any, anything from you? Is anyone else connected on, on video? Gus? <laughs> Oh yeah, they're there. Oh, I, I just want to say excellent work and welcome to CMS. Thanks, <laughs> Andre. <laughs> See you soon. Um, let me ask you a more general question. Uh, so the standard standard model rate uh, Di Higgs isn't expected to be seen until hundred times more data is collected, if that. So why, why, why did you look for continuum? I mean, I understand why you look for residents. Why do you look for continuum, given that? So it's fun to show these plots that, that John made. Um, they're wildly ambitious and, and neglect a lot of subtlety, but they're very cool. So this is the sensitivity we had. <laughs> so remember I said 12? The sensitivity uh, in 2015 was more than 100. So an order of magnitude larger, and you can just say, okay, as I collect data, I expect it to fall off on this trend line. So this is, you know, increase the data set, get better sensitivity. Um, and where is your data set size on this axis? X axis data set size. Sorry, what's your data set size? 27.5. Okay. We're coming to it. Yeah. Um, so, So then this was the next result that I worked on, which was for the iCheck 2016 uh, conference. And we're beating this trend line, and the way, the difference here was in relaxing those stringent PT cuts on the Higgs candidate, um, and then dealing with this enormous background and the trigger turn-ons. Um, and so that was the first step, but we hadn't developed the combinatoric uh, jet issue. And so our way to deal with that was naive and um, limited in its applicability. And the result was we couldn't model the corrected Higgs mass spectrum very well. 
and we didn't have a data-driven way to measure the TT bar background. Um, then, for this, for this result, uh, is now we're still under this trend line, um, and we're, we're we're still beating it. So now you can say, okay, can I fit this with a function and extrapolate a trend line? And this is the hilarious thing that, that John likes to do, um, <laughs> which is do that approximate effective approximate scaling, and then extrapolate that to you know 2035 when we've collected 100 times more data, and you see us beating one. We're under these the standard model expected. Uh, Okay, so this is very absurd. There's a more uh, elaborate extrapolation that's been performed and we don't expect, given our current technology, to be able to beat this. So there's a lot of work that has to be done in keeping the trigger thresholds low. Um, so this requires very, very sophisticated calorimetry in high pilot environments as well as tracking, um, both online and offline. Um, so I've been working on hardware projects to improve online tracking, uh, but then the I think the piece that's also important to, to allude to is that we, we're going to be confirming the standard model, uh, most likely, for the next two decades, at least, um, and not seeing die Higgs production, if we're right here at this limit, is effectively equivalent to saying there isn't some massive change. And in fact, the changes that you need to get baryogenesis or, or uh, fancy new particles to deal with other more um, philosophical issues with the standard model uh, would show up with much larger cross-sections. So really not seeing die production is as valuable as seeing it, um, sort of. <laughs> that's, the, that's the claim that you can make. Uh, it'll be very interesting to not see it, which sounds <laughs> unexciting, but it is. Okay. Yeah. Carlos, any question that you have? No, 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 just on that point, yes, indeed, one can have an enhancement And indeed, uh, not observing it would rule out some models that are interested from the point of view of cosmology. But, uh, There's still room for new, yeah, new physics if you don't see it. Yeah. <laughs> Questions from anybody else? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I have to switch back to the PC for video to talk. Is, uh, well, can <laughs> Gus or uh, Guy, can you try to talk to us again? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. So now if you have any okay. questions. Okay, well, let me... Uh, oh, I, I have a few uh, things. This is very interesting. Uh, when you when you uh, try to merge together 2015-2016 uh, data, so you have to do this, this, this... You get these scaling factors, which are essentially coming out of the process. Is there a way... I mean, you know how the trigger was changed. You know how it was wrong with the 2015. Does, can you make sense of the, the difference in the scaling factor? Or do you just have to trust what comes out of the... Uh, the oh, sorry, the backgrounds between 2015 and 2016? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there are multiple pieces here. Let me... Yeah, it's hard to directly compare the scale factors, largely because of the combinatoric uh, factor, the way we deal with that. So, let me get to... I didn't mention this. But the way we actually measure this pseudo tag factor is just by fitting the n jet distribution. So we pick f to, to optimize this model. And the result is that fairly small fluctuations here can have a large impact on the value of f, but a very small impact on the n jet model itself. Because it depends sensitively. You know, it's a polynomial function of f. So you have a little fluctuation here, it can change f by a lot. To account for that, we then independently uh, normalize the multi-jet background when we do the uh, combined fit to these three regions. And so the result, um, I never found out a good way to put all of this information in the table, but the more directly comparable quantity is if you take the multi-jet factor squared and you multiply that by the multi-jet scale factor, sorry, I didn't say that right, the combinatoric pseudo tag factor squared multiplied by this, is almost identical between 2015 and 2016. There's a 10% residual difference, and that's largely due to um, different detector conditions. So there was higher, higher pileup in 2016, so you have more jets. We do a pileup rejection, but it's not perfect. And then um, the uh, 
biasing of the online VTagging efficiency was different. And so those two effects account for the primary difference in the total multi-jet normalization um, and a slightly different uh, NJet distribution. Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, let's see, Patrick. So in these final states you're looking at, they're very complicated. It's four, four VJets, uh, have a lot of QCD background. Uh, in many searches where one's looking for a small signal against a, a, a big background, there are more computer intensive techniques that get brought into play, uh, going under the name neural networks, boosted decision trees. I wonder if you, and often they lead to improved sensitivity compared to making uh, more straightforward cuts. I wonder if you considered using these techniques. Do you think they hold any promise for the future? Yes. So one piece, the BB Tau Tau result, that was very surprising to the community, relied heavily on these techniques for date for selection, for, for discriminating between signal and background. In BB Tau Tau, most of their background can be well simulated by Monte Carlo. So there you sort of have a direct tool to build a discriminant using simulated events. Given that we have to derive our background in data without Monte Carlo, um, you would be very optimistic to use a multivariate discriminator because it would mean you'd have to model your background to high precision, percent level precision, in a large dimensional space. And what we focused on in this search is really making sure that the key single discriminant is well modeled and that the efficiency of the selection is well modeled. And so that is much easier to do with a cut-based analysis because you're not implicitly relying on subtle correlations between a large number of variables. So I think it can be done, um, but it requires a two-step process that we've started working on. So the first piece is you derive the background model in data with the multivariate technique. So you use either a neural net or a VDT to derive the reweighting functions. Um, you just you build a discriminant on between 2B and 4B without giving the multivariate discriminator B tagging information, and then reweight the output distribution. And that's a single variable. You reweight it once, so you don't have to do an iterative process. Um, so it'll be a lot faster. This takes several hours to derive on the on the Condor cluster here to derive these weights. So that's a pain, and it'll be way worse when we have 100 times more data. So you really, need, you really need to come up with a more, uh, actually it's less computationally intensive to use these machine learning techniques to do the background model and the selection and data. But you have to come up with a way to do a multivariate background model, and that's the piece that's not obvious how to do yet. But we're working on it. Yeah. So, um, so um, you're the, 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 the re-weighting that you have to do is, is large. Right, and, and so well motivated for this analysis, obviously, to be able to do the analysis, um, you have to use those control regions and so on. Um, but thinking to the far future, even to the next generation machine or something like, is there intent to use data like this and other data like it to, you know, iteratively improve the modeling so that in the future you can trust your simulation to do more sophisticated analysis techniques and so on? This is cheating because he asked me this question in our. Uh uh, first committee meeting, so I already have an answer prepared. Your memory's your better. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, an important piece is we can use this fact. I, I claim that the variables that, that I chose to most clearly see the difference between two, be, two heavy flavor and four heavy flavor with at least four jets processes are subtly hinting at the actual physics differences. And so you can, in principle, use something like this to compare an attempt at Monte Carlo um, and tune it to match data. And so the last people who did this um, was a CMS group with 7 TV data, uh, did look at uh, unfolded multi B jet production um, and compared to various generators. Um, and it's a massive amount of work and it needs to be done. Um, but I think we need to interface with phenomenologists who are willing to, to work on this. No one wants to do it, because right. the Monte Carlo, it's just too, it's hard. Right. Um, so, the other important piece of that question is, yeah, how well can you actually just keep doing this process um, of deriving your background model and data? Because in order to get to the sensitivity of one, we have to be statistics limited. If we have large percent level moder modeling uncertainties, we'll never see a signal, um, unless it's enormous, uh, bigger than the modeling uncertainties. Um, so, oh, I'm just the wrong computer.
So when you apply cuts uh, at 150 GeV for your Higgs transverse momentum, you, there's just very little background. So this was um, three inverse number barns. Uh, we have almost 10 times, well, we would have had 10 times as much data if it weren't for a bug in the online trigger, but we can talk about that if you want. Um, the point is, this is about, about 15 events per inverse number barn of data, and given the selection we use now, there's 300. And so with this data set, we're already having to model this top bin at the level of 3%. So you know, with 100 times more data, you're sub-percent level modeling. And for one of the most computationally difficult processes to model. So it is not obvious to me that this procedure will extrapolate to those, those levels of precision. I think the advent of machine learning to do the reweighting um, might make it possible. And if that's true, it's cool. Um, because the machine would basically be learning how the scattering process look, works by example, uh, whereas the theor you know, theoretical community uh, cannot. <laughs> so it would be kind of a fun uh, machine beats, beats person <laughs> battle, if it's possible. But yeah, that's not coming soon anymore. That's real. It exists. <laughs> it's out. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Good. Um, Patrick, you mentioned that you worked on some kind of online tracking. How might that affect the analysis? There's a room full of people that worked on this, um, giggling and asking that question. Uh, yeah, good question, Tova. Um, keeping the. Ah, oh boy. It's not important, I don't need to be. Um, <laughs> In order to keep the, the transverse momentum thresholds low enough to get good sensitivity, um, we can't afford to, to loosen those, those thresholds. It's 40 GeV now. If it gets up to about 60 GeV, we'll very quickly start losing sensitivity. Um, and the online processing of these events at the 100 kilohertz event rate output, well, that's the total trigger rate. The triggers of use in this analysis are about three kilohertz, so 3,000 per second. 20 to 30 percent of the entire computing farm that's sitting next to the detector processing these events live is working to do this. So my analysis is using a significant fraction of the entire online processing resources of, of the collaboration. And almost all of that CPU time is this very complicated issue of what we see in the detector is a bunch of layers of silicon, charged particle goes through it, and you see little deposits, you see a little voltage spike in each of these locations. But what you have are thousands of these. And so all you see are just lots of points. And you have to try all possible combinations of points, fit them to a helical curve, and say, how well does that fit a helix? And if the answer is not well, you throw it away and try again. And so this grows factorially with the, with the occupancy of the detector. Um, and so it's been a huge uh, push to, to offload this process onto a system based in hardware that does all of these combinations in parallel. So you, you, you have custom designed chips that check kind of regions of possible track phase space all at once. Um, and then you select the ones that sort of pass this rough selection. And then you apply a more, more precise stage-wise uh, track fit to those. And you can do all of the tracking in hardware and then provide tracks to the software-based computer that are ready-made. Um, and so then you can take those tracks and refit them with the precision uh, online algorithms. Or you can just take them as they come out of, out of the machine. And this effectively would take that 20% HLT, the CPU resources, and, and make it negligible. So all of this compute time is just tracking. Um, and so you can do it in hardware. Doing it in hardware is extremely difficult. I've been working on a project for the last five years that Mel's been working on for more than a decade um, to do this. And there's a bunch of custom hardware that uh, I'd, I'd be happy to show people because it's cool. Um, and it's taking data now. We are using the system now for the first time to, to compute tracks with hardware. And so we're commissioning it with the Atlas detector currently. Another question. Uh, what would you, what are the most important things to change, improve upon to, uh, for the future for this analysis? Yeah, sub percent level background modeling is the most important thing. Once you can do that, now you can do much more sophisticated uh, searches where you can use multiple signal regions of different levels of purity and do a combined fit. Um, and so 
just naively, if you fit our signal region and control region for signal simultaneously, you can gain 10% sensitivity right there. Um, most of these standard model die Higgs events don't have all of these extra jets in them. So you can also split your signal regions by jet multiplicity, but that requires that you're modeling the jet multiplicity at sub percent level precision. So we need the precision background model in order to be able to do a more sophisticated multi-dimensional fit for signal, including a BDT based uh, selection, which is effectively that, a multi-dimensional multi fit. Um, and then you need to be able to select these events and write them to tape. And being able to do that is also going to be a highly non-trivial effort with hundreds of people. Any other questions from anybody? So, in the resonance searches, uh, there's seems to be an excess of 280 CV. Is that worth looking at, or? or? Um. Also a question he asked in my first committee meeting, yes, uh, but only in a very, you have to win, you have to win the lottery twice for this to be anything. Um, the BB Tau Tau result looked in this exact same place. It's actually slightly more sensitive. CMS has a 4B resonance search where they directly fit the background um, that's also more sensitive. Uh, so in that, in that region of phase space. So the CMS result did see it. I think they could have missed it because of their direct fit procedure fitting a peak on a peak. Um, but the BB tau tau would have seen it, unless you have a new scaler right at the Higgs mass that decays to Bs and not Taus. Um, so you would need two new scalers uh, and yeah, some fine tuning of, of couplings. Two new particles for a new two sigma fit. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's let's thank Patrick again. Great. <laughs>